we have this problem with teen suicide, and it's often with, with kids from very affluent families. It's not a matter of lack of resources or opportunities. Here's just another example. It's very, again, very personal, but we had these, these, these mass shootings. And John West has often dug into this and documented this. Uh, in many, many cases with the mass shootings, there's an underlying philosophical materialism that's involved or a, a, a Darwinian rationale. One of the first major ones that came into the media was the Columbine case in 1999, where 12 students and a teacher were killed by two students who were deeply depressed. And they wrote a manifesto. People, the media was asking, well, why would they do this? And it you know, had to do with all the various left and right political debates were all being debated. But no, it was actually something deeper. It was that they believed that they were helping natural selection along. They were committed Darwinian nihilists. And of course, not all Darwinists are nihilists. Not all Darwinists would, would, would endorse such an action. But these guys were taking the idea very seriously that natural selection culled the herd and we needed to get weak, rid of the weak and the, 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 uh, the biologically failing. And so they, this was part of their manifesto. Natural selection is the best thing that ever happened to the earth, getting rid of all the stupid and weak organisms. It's all nat- but it's all natural. Yes, it's good. Um, and so we could go on. And one of, one of the people on the panel tonight is Nancy Piercy. And I've had a long admiration for her work because one of the things that Nancy does so well is show the connection between ideas and how ideas have consequences and how these fundamental ideas about, uh, about prime reality and, and our, our basic worldview end up affecting m- many, many different aspects of life. If we had more time, we could map all of them. But we're going to talk more about that in the conversation that follows. Just one more example, the sanctity of life, the whole issue of abortion. Uh, if you, you've got two different views. If, you, you're, if you're a theist, you think of the, the, the developing fetus as a human being made in God's image. If you're a materialist, you think of the developing fetus as a lump of tissue, as a group of cells. And that makes all the difference in the, in the position you take on this contentious issue. The underlying worldview has a profound influence on the way you're going to think about that political and social issue. Now, the 19th century, as I, I said, was where most of this started. Darwin told us where we came from. Marx had a utopian and materialistic vision of the future about where we were, we were going to end up. And Freud, early in the 20th century, told us what to do about our guilt. And so between these three great materialistic scientist philosophers, or scientific philosophers, these different theories were answering all the basic questions that traditional Judeo-Christian belief had always answered, but in materialistic terms. And I think it's fair to say that we, we have seen the consequence of that through the 20th century and, and now into our own. Okay, I told you it was a somber opening, but now here's the good news. There is a tremendous change taking place in science and philosophy. And it's taking place at the highest levels of scientific and philosophical discourse. It's still controversial, it's still contentious, but what's driving it are major changes in philosophical thinking and also major discoveries that have been made in science. And I just want to tick off three with a brief description of each to get our conference going. Some of you who have read some of our books from Discovery Institute. If you've been kind enough to uh, pick up a copy of my book at one point, you you will be familiar with these three discoveries. The first is, and most unexpected, that the material universe had a beginning. You may remember the quotation from Richard Dawkins where he says, the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if at bottom there is no purpose, no design, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Blind, pitiless indifference is shorthand for materialistic worldview. So he's saying the, material, the, the, the universe we observe has exactly the properties we should expect if the materialistic worldview is, is, is correct. Well, that has, in three very important respects, proven to be incorrect. One of the great discoveries of 20th century science was that the material universe had a beginning. And you may know something of the story that started in the 19-teens and 20s. Astronomers began to use these great big dome telescopes Edwin Hubble was one of the first, and he was using the 100-inch Hooker telescope at uh, Mount Wilson in California. And through that telescope, and with the use of new photographic plate technology, he was able to uh, resolve little tiny points of light in the distant night sky, which had been somewhat mysterious before. People didn't know whether they were, astronomers didn't know whether they were stars with gas around them, 
within our galaxy or whether they might be galaxies in their own right. And what, what Hubble discovered, to make a long story short, is they were not only galaxies in their own right, but they were galaxies that were expanding outward in every direction of the night sky. And I had the opportunity here in Dallas in 1985, when I was very early in my career, to attend a conference that discussed the evidence about the origin of the universe. And one of the scientists there was Alan Sandage. And Sandage was a long, well, he was a student of Edwin Hubble. He'd been very involved in verifying the expansion of the universe outward from a singular beginning point, from a creation event. And at the conference, he announced that he had become a Christian, which was shocking to the audience there. They, it included uh, some of the other cosmologists and astrophysicists were people like Carl Sagan's science advisor, uh, Donald Goldschmidt. Um, and uh, Sanders explained how the evidence of, of, the, of a beginning to the universe had shaken his materialistic faith. And eventually that led him to soul searching and to a full religious conversion. And what he said about it was extremely memorable to me. He, at the time he was describing all the evidence for this beginning point past which you could not go any further back. And he said, here is evidence for what can only be described as a supernatural event. There's no way this could have been predicted within the realm of physics as we know it. Hard-bitten scientific materialist changed his worldview in response to one of the great discoveries of 20th century science, that the, materialist, or that the material universe had a beginning. Second great discovery, this in physics more than just astrophysics or cosmology, and that is that from the very beginning of the universe, the fundamental physical parameters of the universe, the laws of physics, what are called the constants of physics, and the initial condition of the matter and energy at the beginning of the universe, all these fundamental factors were very, as the physicists say, finely tuned to allow for the possibility of life. By fine tuning, they mean that these physical parameters are balanced on a razor's edge. They fall, if you're an engineer, within very fine tolerances outside of which life would be impossible and even basic chemistry would be impossible, such that you can't say that the evolutionary process evolved to take advantage of the finely tuned parameters. We had to have fine tuning for any kind of evolution of any kind to be possible at all, and still less, and still more for there to be life. And so many of the, the great uh, uh, physicists of the 20th century and our century have been talking about our universe as a kind of Goldilocks universe. There's a major book out right now by a, a, a young astrophysicist named Luke Barnes called The Fortunate Universe. And the idea is that all these different parameters, and you could think of a kind of universe creating machine with dials and knobs to get the, the idea across, each one representing one of the physical parameters, each one of those dials, knobs, or sliders is set to a very precise value. Again, such that if you m moved it one click this way or that, you'd get a catastrophic consequence that would make life impossible, a heat death or a collapse into a giant black hole, that sort of a thing. So one of the physicists who discovered these, some of these parameters, Sir Fred Hoyle, said a common sense interpretation of the data suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as chemistry and biology to make life possible. You may have heard me say before that I always love the way the monkeys make it into the origins scenarios, <laughs> even in physics. Okay, last big discovery, third big discovery, and that is, th we'll talk a lot about this tomorrow morning, so I'll cover this very quickly, but to me this was the one that rocked my world. It was the discovery of the digital code stored in the DNA molecule, that at the foundation of life, we have a molecule that literally stores information. And you know, may know a little bit of the story. Watson and Crick elucidate the structure of the DNA molecule in 1953. In 1957, 1958, Francis Crick, working on his own, formulates something called the sequence hypothesis in which he realizes that the chemical subunits running along the interior of that famed and beautiful double helix molecule, those subunits are functioning like alphabetic characters in a written text or digital characters in a section of machine code. And that has raised an extraordinary question, which is where did all that digital information come from? Bill Gates has said that DNA is like a software program, but much more advanced, far more advanced than any software we've ever created. That's a highly suggestive remark because we know that software comes from programmers. 
And in fact, whenever we see information and we trace it back to its source, whether we're talking about a hieroglyphic inscription or a paragraph in a book or a headline in a newspaper or information embedded in a radio signal or built into a software program, that information has always come from a mind, from an intelligent source, not an undirected material process. So, of course, I've developed this argument in about 500 pages. Uh, we're just sketching it right now. But it's one of the three big factors that suggests that a designing intelligence has indeed played a role in the origin of life in the universe. So three big discoveries. The material universe had a beginning. The universe has been fine-tuned for life from the very beginning. And there is evidence of design in life, in particular, the big infusions of digital information that have been infused into our biosphere since the beginning of the universe. One great historian of science says that the idea that God created the universe is a more respectable hypothesis today than any time in the last hundred years. In my book, I go a little further than that and say that the postulation of a transcendent, intelligent, and active creator the kind of creator we find in the Judeo-Christian scriptures, provides the best overall explanation for biological and cosmological origins, where everything came from. 